my great grandfather fought during World War I as an infantryman in the British Army. I grew up hearing tales of the Great War, passed down from my great grandfather to my grandparents, to my parents, to me. I remember being told about how my great grandfather earned a distinguished conduct medal for manning a Vickers machine gun all by himself to cover a retreat after the original crew were slain by an enemy rifleman. They told me he once tossed a German potato masher grenade right back into no man's land only seconds before it detonated. I remember looking at a black and white photograph of him as a young man shortly after the war and noticing the eye patch which obscured the scarred hole left behind from a German stormtrooper's knife. About a week ago, I was going through my grandmother's things after she passed away and stumbled across a slim leather-bound notebook. Opening the cover, I noticed that the first page was signed with my great-grandfather's name. I read the entire manuscript in a matter of an hour or so. It wasn't particularly long, and what was contained within was so bizarre that I couldn't help but read it cover to cover. What follows is a transcription of my great-grandfather's journal, mildly edited for my own privacy. Names and certain other minor details have been slightly altered and or obfuscated so as to avoid any unscrupulous individuals using this information to find out who I am. My name is Raymond Phillips, and what I am about to describe, I have never written down nor told anyone about before now. I am an old man, and I am afraid that I do not have long on this earth. I do not fear death, God knows I faced it countless times, but I do fear the loss of knowledge that my demise may bring about. During my service in the British Army from 1916 until my honorable discharge in 1918, I had three separate, horrifying experiences which are permanently seared into my memory like a brand upon skin. I'm afraid I cannot provide the specific dates for these events as I did not enter them into my diary when they occurred, and time washes away from memory all things not safely recorded in ink or trauma. As a younger man, I convinced myself they were mere delusions, the product of some brain fever brought on by the rigors of combat. With the certainty of age, however, comes clarity and the understanding that what happened to me was real. My first experience with what some may call the paranormal occurred at some point in 1916. At that time, the war on the Western Front was a bit of a stalemate, with neither side gaining much ground over the other. I found myself stationed in the trenches of northeastern France. It was while we were moving in to relieve the troops at the front line that I got the first hint of what was to come. As we were getting settled in, I took notice of a young man in a stretcher. He was gibbering and yelling quite loudly about those horrible, infernal rats and seemed to be thrashing about rather intensely. Looking closer, I noticed he was strapped down with wild eyes staring out desperately. At the time, I assumed it was some strange form of shell shock. In any event, I got myself all settled in for the upcoming days of tense boredom, which characterized one's stay on the front lines. There was never enough to do to occupy one's time. But at the same time, you could never truly relax. Not in a place like that. The infrequent sounds of gunfire and artillery made staying calm a Herculean feat. It was nearly always cold and damp, with rats scurrying underfoot. While the verminous little beasties were far from pleasant, I still didn't quite understand how they could find the chap in the stretcher so badly. Not when there were so many other, more practical horrors with which to occupy one's mind. Even on the quietest of days, you'd need to keep your wits about you. Death was always nearby. There were almost daily casualties, one or two men dying from disease, artillery, or a well-placed shot from a German rifle on the other side of no man's land. The bodies of the dead, when we could safely recover them, were stacked up in a relatively unused portion of the trench and covered with a blanket. They would remain there until such time as they could receive some form of proper burial. Standing guard in that particular area was, obviously, 
not a particularly enviable position. I found myself on guard duty one night, relatively isolated from the rest of the men. Nobody ever slept too close to the corpse pile, so I didn't even have an unconscious companion to break the stillness with snoring. I was alone, with only the distant roar of artillery in a pile of the dead to keep me company. As I stood there, cigarette in one hand, rifle in the other, I began to hear the sound of faint digging, as if mud was being moved aside with a small shovel. I looked around for the source of the noise, wondering if it was just my imagination, or God forbid, the Germans were tunneling into our trench. Extinguishing my cigarette in the damp mud, I readied my rifle in a fixed spare net, preparing myself to fight and sound the alarm if need be. As I peered about the trench, I noticed a hint of movement from under the blanket which obscured the bodies of the dead. The sound of digging continued, and my heart began to thump louder in my chest as I approached its source. Very gently, using my bayonet, I lifted the edge of the blanket. As I did so, I caught a glimpse of the rotting, disfigured face of the man beneath it, and had to look away for a moment to wretch. When I composed myself, I looked again, and saw with horror that the body appeared to be moving slightly. My face went pale as I grew worried about the possibility that the dead man may be awakening, until I realized that the corpse was being pulled towards the side of the trench, as if someone within the wall was grasping it by the ankles to drag it into some unseen tunnel. Determined now, I lifted the blanket off the pile entirely aiming my rifle towards what I thought was the source of the digging sound and the corpse's movement. I gasped in abject horror as I saw a pair of scabrous, sharp-tipped claws extending out of the trench wall from a crudely dug hole, grabbing hold of the corpse with both hands. I was shaking with fright, causing me to miss my shot at the beast and hit one of the corpses instead, causing a splash of coagulated blood to spray out of the bullet hole. There was a monstrous screech as though the sound of some overgrown rodent, and the claws retreated back into the hole, the makeshift tunnel collapsing as it did so. I stood careful watch over the corpse pile for the rest of my shift, listening intently for any sounds of scratching or digging. But none came. Nobody questioned the gunshot the day after, as we were all fairly used to gunfire by night in the trenches. And so, I gave no explanation for it. I would like to say that was my only encounter with one of those vile creatures. But I did have one more, a few weeks after the first. One of the officers got into his head that we ought to sneak across no man's land by night and conduct a small trench raid. A few unfortunate lads, including myself, were assigned to the raid. And at around midnight, we went marching off towards the German trench under the cover of darkness. We were about halfway through no man's land when one of my comrades, a chap by the name of Corporal Douglas, I believe, was shot in the chest by a German sniper. As he fell, spluttering and coughing up blood, I dug down to the ground, looking for cover. I found it in the form of a small crater, evidently formed from an artillery shell detonation. I dragged Douglas into the crater as I heard the chatter of machine gun fire melt with the screams of the dying. Evidently, either the German army was more attentive than we had expected, or we weren't nearly so stealthy as we thought. I took a look at the corporal's wound, paying mind not to raise my head over the edge of our makeshift shelter. It looked bad, worse than the simple soldier like myself had any chance to mend. Still, I did what I could. I poured a bit of whiskey from Douglas's hip flask on the bullet hole, giving the rest to him to drink. Then. Using my knife, I cut a strip of cloth from my tunic into a makeshift bandage, wrapping it around the wound to keep some pressure on it and staunch the flow of blood. All the while, as I worked on caring for Corporal Douglas's injury, my ears were assaulted with the sounds of gunfire and shrieks of agony. I tuned it out as best as I could, focusing on what could be done rather than the all-pervading death which surrounded us. Eventually, 
After some minutes, the sounds of combat stopped. I surmised that one of two things had occurred. Either our lads had reached the German trench and slain the defenders, or that the bodies of my fallen comrades were currently enriching the soil with their own spilled blood. Taking off my helmet, I placed it on the end of my rifle and extended it upwards into the sky, just barely peeking over the edge of the crater. In an instant, the helmet went flying off into the darkness with a resounding clang as the report of a German rifle echoed in the distance. Evidently, Douglas and I were pinned down. Douglas had been silent throughout this whole business, save for the occasional gurgle or groan of pain. I figured the poor chap was in shock, given the extent of his injury. I wished I had a blanket of some kind to give him. I read somewhere about that being an effective remedy in these circumstances. With nothing else to be done, I lit a cigarette and began to smoke, trying to steady my freight nerves. I offered one to Douglas, but he didn't even seem to notice it. He just continued staring straight ahead while wheezing. A few hours must have passed. It must have been perhaps two or three o'clock in the morning when I heard the sound of claws digging through dirt and mud. The familiar noise sent a shiver up my spine and I peered around the crater, rifle at the ready. It was rather difficult to see purely by moonlight, but I noticed some earth crumbling at the far end of the crater. Raising my rifle to my shoulder, I aimed for the spot and pulled the trigger. I was greeted with a quiet click. Panicking, I ejected the cartridge and cycled the new one into the chamber, hoping it was merely a problem with the ammunition rather than the gun's mechanism. Once again, I aimed and squeezed the trigger, praying. A faint click emanated from the weapon, and nothing else happened. Cursing, I tossed the rifle aside, looking around for some other weapon with which to defend Douglas and myself. I of course had my knife, but having seen the claws of that thing in the trench, I had no desire to try my luck in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I could see its claws emerging from the ground, sharp and rodent-like. Finally, my eyes landed on the corporal's revolver, and I swiftly grabbed it from the holster and fired a shot towards the unholy beast. Thankfully, the sidearm seemed to be in perfect working condition, and the projectile struck true. There was an awful shriek, something like a cross between a red squeak and the wailing of a man in pain, and the claws fell limp. Though I still couldn't see the thing's face buried in the mud, Evidently, I had correctly guessed its position and put the bastard out of its misery. I clapped Corporal Douglas on the shoulder and whooped in glee, but my celebration proved to be short-lived. Scarcely had the expression of joy left my lips when I heard the sounds of tunneling once again, this time to my right. I aimed the pistol at the sound of the disturbed earth and waited. My hands were shaking through a combination of adrenaline and fear, so it was difficult to steady my aim. I decided to wait until I could see the whites of my hitherto unseen foe's eyes, so as to ensure the best shot possible. As it turned out, the creature that emerged from the dirt didn't have eyes. A snout covered in greasy, pockmarked skin popped out of the earth, snuffling as it began to pull the rest of its bulk through the crude tunnel with its enormous claws. It was roughly man-shaped, resembling some sort of quadrupedal ape. Though in overall appearance, it suggested nothing so much as an overgrown mangy rat. A set of sharp, jagged incisors extended out from its lips as it continued to sniff the air, evidently looking for food. After several seconds, I finally regained my composure enough to pull the trigger. Unfortunately, in my panic, I unloaded not one, but five rounds into the beast, only stopping when Corporal Douglas's revolver ran out of ammunition. I continued pulling the trigger long after the beast had howled its death cry and slumped to the ground, motionless. Exhausted and under considerable mental strain, I finally put down the revolver and pulled out my cigarettes yet again, though the shaking of my hands made lighting one fairly difficult. It must have been a half hour or so after I shot the thing that the digging started up again. This time, I heard it from all around me. <laughs>
I grabbed once more for the corporal's pistol before realizing it was still out of ammunition. Panicking, I rummaged about at his belt, looking for a speed loader. Corporal Douglas continued his heavy, gurgling breathing, still completely unresponsive. It took me a moment to notice the corpse of the thing I had shot earlier being dragged down back into the hole from whence it came. Either the demoniac things had some sort of burial ritual for their dead, or, more likely, they possessed no moral objections to cannibalism. I finally found Douglas's spare ammunition and fumbled with the revolver, attempting to reload it as swiftly as possible. In my haste, I accidentally picked my head slightly above the rim of the crater and heard the whiz of a bullet pass by inches from my ear. Quickly, I fell back down to the ground, but dropped the spit loader in the process. Scrambling about in the mud for the fallen object, I heard digging from right next to me, from where Corporal Douglas lay. I looked up and saw a set of those awful clawed hands pawing at him, beginning to drag him into the ground. Screaming in combination of rage and terror, I drew my knife and attempted to stab at the vile claws, but I missed my mark, driving my knife into the dirt instead. The thing grasping Douglas reached out his claw and slashed at my arm, causing me to yelp in pain as I staggered backwards. Doing my best to try and stop the bleeding, I watched in terror as those awful claws pulled poor Douglas into the burrow from which they emerged, all the while he groaned and gurgled senselessly. I wept in horror, and quite out of my mind, ran out of the crater and towards our trench. As for how I survived that perilous flight across no man's land, I have no idea. It must have been blind luck, I suppose. In any event, I woke a few days later in a battlefield hospital, screaming about rats. A doctor told me I was suffering from some sort of brain fever and that I should be fine after a few days of rest. Nobody asked me about Corporal Douglas. And so, like with my first encounter with those inhuman monsters, I proffered no explanation. I never met with any of those horrid creatures again, thankfully. But the war was far from over, and there was plenty more time to come face to face with unimaginable horrors, both mundane and supernatural. I will work on transcribing the remaining two entries as soon as I have time. I tried doing some research to see if any other soldiers on the Western Front described similar creatures and found disturbing results, though I was unable to find any convincing first-hand sources. There are numerous references to so-called rat men or trench ghouls in a variety of publications relating to supernatural events during the Great War. If I find anything more solid, I'll be sure to bring it up in the follow-up post. Unfortunately, since my last post, I still have been unable to find any reliable information regarding my great-grandfather's first supernatural encounter. I've seen one paper theorizing that the constant chemical warfare could have led to mutations in the local rat populations, but that theory seems rather far-fetched and isn't fully consistent with the creatures my great-grandfather described. In any event, I've given up researching the matter for now and have instead focused on transcribing the rest of the journal. What follows is the second supernatural experience recorded by my great-grandfather. As with before, names and other details have been altered to protect my identity. It was a bit over a year since my encounter with those rodent-like creatures before anything I would label as supernatural occurred again. I'm not entirely sure of the exact month, but I'm certain it was in the winter of 1917. In any event, things had been continuing essentially the same, with constant deaths, very little ground gained, and the never-ending din of distant artillery to serve as a lullaby. During this time, I befriended another soldier by the name of Gordon Lindsay. Lindsay was a fairly jovial fellow, always quick with a joke to lighten the mood, which could be in turn infuriating or endearing depending upon the particulars of any given situation. I recall a particular incident in which another infantryman happened to have been shot in a rather, shall we say, sensitive area 
The poor fellow was laid up in bed, whereupon Lindsay walked up to him and cheerfully announced, Keep your chin up, mate. At least you've got an excuse for its length now. I've never seen someone so previously immobile get up that quickly before. Gordon had a black eye for a week or two after that. It was almost surprising to learn that Lindsay was fairly well educated, given his constant joking and manner of speech. He spoke both French and German, and had been working on a degree of some sort before he was drafted. He only seemed to sober up from his pleasant, happy-go-lucky attitude whenever he heard someone on the other side of no man's land cry out in pain or fear. To you lot, I remember him saying once. Here's just all a bunch of gibberish in it. Just sounds, discarded as easily as the gobbling of a turkey about to be slaughtered for a Christmas dinner. But I hear what they're saying, don't I? Hear them cry for their mum, or talk about how much it hurts. I sometimes wish I never bloody studied German. It would make killing them so much easier. I didn't know much how to respond to that statement. So I just offered him a cigarette, which he gladly took. The whole nasty business began one night when the Germans tried to surprise our trench with a nighttime raid. Luckily for us, one of the lads on watch managed to spot them, so we were able to repel most of them before we were in bayonet range. A few of them, however, managed to get down into the trench and caused a bit of chaos. Initially, I was barely conscious, having been woken up from a fistful sleep by shouts to take up arms. However, a shot whizzing by your head works wonders to clear the fuck from one's mind. Firing a rifle accurately in such close quarters is no easy feat, but I managed to get a shot off at one of our attackers, striking him in the leg. The poor bladder went down screaming bloody murder, and I was glad that I couldn't understand German. I imagine the things he must have been saying about me are not suitable for repetition. Looking around, I spotted Lindsay taking aim with his rifle at one of the Germans completely unaware that right behind him was a man with a rather nasty looking knife. I yelled out to him to turn around, and to his credit, he did, immediately firing a shot into his would-be attacker's gut. The fighting was over. All of the trench raiders had been either killed, had surrendered, or were otherwise incapacitated. I jogged over to Lindsay, asking him if he was alright. As I reached him, I saw that he was staring at the man with the knife, following his gaze. I looked down at the fallen soldier, realizing that he wasn't quite dead. As I watched, the man made direct eye contact with Lindsay, and cut his own palm with his knife. Blood poured out of the wound, but the man didn't even flinch. He just kept staring right into Lindsay's eyes, boring into his very soul. Finally, he broke the silence, murmuring out the words, Der Hund wird sie in sieben Tagen holen. After uttering those words, his face went blank, and his eyes clouded over. The man was dead. What did he say? I asked Lindsay, who was still staring directly at the corpse. He didn't respond. Grabbing his arm, I repeated my question. Damn it, Lindsay. What did he say? Shaking his head, Lindsay managed to mutter. He said, The hound will take you in seven days. He looked away from the corpse and over to me, giving a desperate half smile. A bit of an odd one, that. Ain't it, Phillips? Must have. Must have been trying to give me a bit of a scare, don't you think? I nodded, seeing how much this was affecting him. There was this look of real, primal fear on his face. Now, of course, I'd seen Lindsay kill people before. He didn't like it. Only someone who was a bit sick in the head cut. But I'd never seen him this afraid before. Must be some sort of obscure German insult. Or maybe he was just starting to lose his head. Could be anything really, Lindsay. I wouldn't pay it too much mind. I said, trying to reassure him. He shook his head and chuckled weakly. He didn't lose his head, you half-wit. You and I both know I shot him quite squarely in the chest. Laughing, 
I clapped Lindsay on the shoulder and pulled him off to join the others and figure out our next move. He seemed to be mostly back to his old self for the moment. But whenever he wasn't talking or cracking jokes, I could see the distance in his eyes, like he was still hearing the words that German soldiers said to him. For the next three days, things went largely back to normal, though I could sometimes see Lindsay staring off into space with an odd look on his face. It sometimes seemed like he was listening to some sound that I couldn't hear. I assumed he was just in a bit of funk. Combat can do that to a fellow. It wasn't until the fourth day that something actually strange happened. I was having a supper of tinned fish when suddenly Lindsay grabbed me by the arm and pulled me off to one side. I wasn't particularly upset by this, as the meal was somewhat far from gourmet, but I was rather confused. Lindsay, what's going on old chap? What's gotten you in such a bother? I asked, standing my ground and keeping us both in place. Listen Phillips, I have to show you something but… He looked around, seeming to check if anyone was around to listen. You have to promise me not to tell anyone, alright? I stared at Lindsay, giving a better look at the expression on his face. He was terrified and completely serious. I nodded, and he led me to a relatively quiet area of the trench, crouched down and pointed at the muddy ground. I followed where his finger pointed and stared for a moment before I processed what I was looking at. Pressed in the muck were a series of paw prints each one at least a foot in length, pressing down a good five centimeters or so into the earth. Lindsay and I followed the trail of paw prints until they stopped at one of the trench walls. Peering carefully over the side, we saw the trail continued into the distant tree line. What manner of beast could leave prints like this? I muttered to myself, staring into the distant forest. Lindsay began to laugh hysterically. Oh well. This is just bloody brilliant, isn't it? On the one hand, you can see the prints too, so I've not gone totally bar me. On the other hand, there's a damn hellhound out to get me. He began to double over with the intensity of his laughter, whooping and hollering in some sort of mania. I slapped him once or twice to try and pull him together, but it didn't work. He just kept laughing and laughing. Eventually, it grew to be too much for me and I left him to his madness, storming off to find a dry spot to try and get some sleep. All night long, I could hear him cackling to himself, even over the endless percussion of distant explosions. When I did finally get comfortable enough to get a bit of rest, I dreamt I was being pursued through the trenches by an unseen enormous hound. The day after his laughing fit, Lindsay had become very quiet and kept mostly to himself. Everybody had heard him have his breakdown, and most of the lads steered clear of him, worried that he had gotten a bit funny in the head. I suppose I can't properly blame them, but it still felt bad seeing the poor chap all on his own. I tried to talk to him from time to time, but he just wouldn't respond. All he would do is stare off into space, at night, sometimes I would hear distant baying. I prayed that they were only wolves. It was seven days after the German soldier made his pronouncement when Lindsay finally spoke again. It was late at night. Both of us were on watch, sharing a cigarette together in silence. Even if he wouldn't talk, Lindsay still had enough awareness to smoke. The artillery seemed a bit louder than usual that night, and every so often, there would be an explosion out in no man's land that illuminated darkness with a fiery explosion. I wasn't sure what the Germans were doing, but it made me nervous. I kept wondering if the next shell might strike us, but I wouldn't even have a chance to realize I was going to die before my life ended in a loud bang and a puff of smoke. Lindsay was staring off into no man's land, when suddenly, very calmly, he pointed out into the distance and spoke a single word. 
Look. I looked out where he indicated, straining my eyes in the pitch black of the night. I don't see anything. I started to say, when suddenly an artillery shell burst, throwing light upon the scorched landscape. I saw it, standing there amongst the ruin and madness of mechanized warfare. I gazed upon the hound. It was as big as a tank and black as smoke, with two burning red eyes gazing hungrily towards us. The thing had to be at least three meters high at the shoulder, but I can't say for sure. Ivory fangs jutted from its slavering maw, foam dripping from its lips. I felt like a mouse staring into the face of an owl, or a fox gazing down the barrel of a hunter's gun. The flash of the explosion lasted only an instant, before all was darkness yet again. But even in the blackness, I could see those terrible red eyes staring towards our trench with an evil unearthly hunger. I practically fell backwards in terror, all sense of discipline and duty overcome by the sheer horror invoked by that monstrous infernal hound. Don't be frightened, Phillips. It's not you at once, murmured Lindsay, still gazing out at the hound. Without another word, he began to climb over the edge of the trench, walking out into no man's land. He showed no fear, no trepidation. The look on his face was almost one of relief, as he vanished into the dark. I scrambled over to the edge of the trench, not daring to follow him. I called out his name, begged him to come back, but he didn't even respond. Another explosion, and I saw the silhouette of my friend mere meters away from the hound, getting down on his knees before it. Its mouth was open now, its slavering maw filled to the brim with dagger-like fangs. Lindsay! I screamed, tears flowing down my face. The brief light from the explosion was swallowed up by the night. I waited for another explosion, each second feeling like hours. Finally, another detonation lit up no man's land. But. There was nothing there. There was no more hound, no more Lindsay, not so much as a corpse or a pile of shredded clothes. In the far, far distance, I could hear a low, savage howl. Officially, Private Gordon Lindsay deserted the British Army. They never found a body, and there was no record of his death. So, that would be the natural assumption. But I know the truth. Even now, nearly half a century later, I cannot abide the baying of hounds. Unlike my great-grandfather's first encounter, black dogs and hellhounds were well attested in folklore, with quite a number of sightings all throughout Europe. There are even a few alleged encounters along the Western Front. I looked into official records regarding Private Lindsay's disappearance and was able to confirm that he was reported to have deserted the British Army in 1917. Beyond that, the rest is impossible to verify. When I have time, I shall transcribe and post the final entry of my great-grandfather's journal. What follows is the final entry of my great-grandfather's journal. As with the first two entries, I must again stress that I have made minor changes to it with regards to any information which could trace back to me. But the rest is completely unaltered. Unlike the rather considerable gap between my encounters with those carnivorous rat things and that awful ordeal with the hound, my final experience with the weird occurred less than a year after the previous one. It was the fall of 1918, and it was becoming apparent that the war was nearing its natural conclusion. How soon victory would come, nobody knew. But there was a somewhat renewed sense of vigor about us all, perhaps partially due to the torrential flood of fresh American troops. In any event, 
As the war progressed, tanks became a much more common sight on the battlefield. I was no stranger to them by this point, having seen a quite of them trundling their way across no man's land. But as time went on, they became more and more numerous. I even got to witness some tank on tank battles a handful of times, and I dare say in some ways, it was more horrifying to see those enormous steel brutes fight it out than any supernatural deviltry. My final brush with the supernatural began during one of the aforementioned tank battles. I was hiding behind some rubble as the thundering of naval guns filled my ears. The percussive sound occasionally disrupted with the staccato of machine gun fire. The Germans had brought a handful of captured MK4s to fight off our own, and the level of violence was astounding, even for someone as inured to bloodshed as I was. Oftentimes, it felt that for us infantrymen, we would spend more time hiding than trying to disable the damn things. I picked over the edge of my makeshift concealment, rifle at the ready, looking around for any opponents not currently protected by steel plates. There were only four or five of the German tanks, more than outnumbered by our own. But what they lacked in numbers, they more than made up for in brutality. As I surveyed the worn torn ruins, I spotted a great German war machine open fire on one of our own tanks with a tremendous boom of its six-pounder. When the smoke cleared, I could see that the British tank seemed to have been stopped dead in its tracks, fire leaking out of the charred husk. I had a split second to notice the German tank's machine gun aim in my direction and duck down behind the rubble once again. The chatter of the tank's machine gun quieted down after a few seconds of whizzing bullets, and I suddenly became horribly aware of how easily my makeshift cover would be blown to pieces by the tank's larger gun. I looked for an exit, noticing a slightly sturdier looking bit of cover a few meters away. Deciding to chance it, I ran out from behind the rubble, sprinting at full speed. A tremendous explosion from directly behind me made my ears ring, and I was carried into the air by the force of the shockwave, falling upon the ruined crown. Stunned, I could only gaze feebly as I watched the steel juggernaut approach my prone form. Seemingly, they planned on saving ammunition by simply crushing me to death beneath the tank's threats. As I stared helplessly at my oncoming doom, the ruined husk of the British tank started to move again the barrel of one of its six-pounders aiming at the rear of my would-be executioner. The gun fired, and there was an enormous earth-shuddering boom, so loud that I could hear it even through the ringing in my ears. The tank I was sure would kill me ceased all motion, and I blacked out, presumably from the rather nasty knock on the head I had received only moments prior. When I awoke, I was still on the ground, covered in dust and bits of rubble. I stood up, rubbing the large knot on the back of my head. Luckily, aside from a terrible headache, I seemed none the worse for wear. The sounds of fighting had ceased, and nobody shot me after I stood back up, so I figured the battle must have been over. I went looking for the rest of the lads, and as I made my search, I noticed dozens upon dozens of corpses, both Germans and our chaps some of whom were crushed into paste under the weight of tank treads. I shuddered as I thought of what could have happened had the tank not fired when it did. Eventually, I finally saw the rest of my company, who seemed to be chattering on quite excitedly about something. As I approached, I began to hear more clearly what they were talking about. Do you think the driver went mad? Good lord, I swear it took out as many of us as it did the Germans. One man asked, a look of horror on his face. It couldn't have been just the driver. The whole crew had to have been in on it. Otherwise, why would the machine guns have mowed down everything in sight? Said another, his arm in a sling. I could have sworn that I saw it get taken down earlier. A direct hit from a German tank. There's no way anyone could have survived that. Added a third man as he lit a cigarette. As I was about to ask what they were talking about, an officer, Sergeant Bentley, I believe was his name, blew his whistle, and we all stood at attention on instinct. All right, gentlemen, that's quite enough chit chat, said Sergeant Bentley. Just because we have won the battle 
doesn't mean we have time to stand around and gossip. Now, as most of you are probably aware, it seems as if one of our tank crews got a bit, shall we say, overzealous. Overzealous? They went bloody berserk, cried out one of the men, breaking the silence. Quiet, shouted Bentley, staring daggers at the speaker. As I was saying, they seemed to have gotten a bit carried away in the heat of battle, and there were a few incidents of friendly fire. Now, that tank seems to have run off as it were, out into the forest. We assume that the crew feels guilty for what they've done, and have chosen to try and flee the consequences of their actions. Therefore, I'm sending out a small team to try and track down the blighters. Any volunteers? I don't know why I raised my hand. To this day, I genuinely don't have the foggiest idea, but raise it I did, and before I knew it, I and a few of the other lads were out charging through the forest, following a trail of crushed undergrowth and knocked over trees. As we first entered the forest, we could still hear the sounds of combat in the far distance. However, as we proceeded further into the woods, the faraway thunder of artillery grew quieter and quieter, until we were surrounded entirely by silence. After so much violence, so much noise, silence can become more disturbing than the din of active combat. To our shaken minds, every snap twig was an approaching soldier's footfalls, each gust of wind the whispering orders in a foreign tongue, and every creaking tree was a tank's engine. We proceeded with painful slowness, stopping frequently whenever anything even hinted at the remotest possibility of an ambush. After about a half hour, we began to hear the sound of a rumbling engine through the intense silence. We slowed our pace even further and crept carefully towards the noise, making sure to be as quiet as possible. After a few minutes, we spotted our quarry. The tank seemed to have gotten stuck in a ditch of some sort. Ordinarily, a problem like that would take only minutes to solve just requiring the crew to get out and use an unditching beam to get the vehicle out. Given how comparatively quickly tanks can move even through the roughest terrain, it didn't make sense why they would just leave the tank there long enough for us to catch up. They must have gotten out and continued on foot, and just left the tank here with the engine running. One of my comrades observed, in getting out from behind cover and stepping towards the immobilized war machine. As he began to stand up, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and I instinctively began to shout, Get back here, man! But it was too late. As soon as he left the obscuring cover of the brush, one of the machine gun sparrows pointed towards the man and let loose a stream of leaden death. Once the telltale chatter of the machine gun reached the ears of the other men, panic ensued, tension was high, and the sudden sound of bullets whizzing through the air caused most of my comrades to run screaming into the woods. Some were cut down as they fled, but most managed to get out of range into the trees. I, however, remained in the brush, focused on one of the tank's doors. The one on the right pontoon, it seemed slightly ajar, and the tank was just at the right angle to where I could conceivably make it without attracting any machine gun fire. Sprinting quickly, I rushed over to the door, pulling it open all the way and rushing inside, knife in hand. I expected I would need to grab the right pontoon's gunner and hold him hostage in order to force them to stop firing. It didn't seem like an easy task, but I didn't much relish the idea of just tossing a grenade in and killing the lot of them. Deserters, perhaps even traitors, they may have been, but I had no desire to kill any of my fellows. As soon as I jumped into the tank, however, I was met with a rather different sight than I expected. Inside the tank, I was greeted by the stench of ash and burnt meat. Seven corpses were scattered about the interior, all horribly burnt. The only living person was a young man in the driver's position. As soon as I looked about in confusion, he grabbed me violently, wrenching the knife out of my hand and sending it clattering onto the floor. He punched me in the stomach knocking the wind out of me and giving him a chance to dry his pistol. Nice try, Fritz, 
The driver spoke, gun aimed squarely at my head. But you won't be able to stop us that easily. We're going to continue our advance all the way to Berlin if we have to. Stuttering, I replied. What? What the devil are you talking about, man? I'm on your side. A strange look crossed the driver's face, almost like he was trying to remember something, before he shook it off and regained focus. No, you're not. You're clearly a German spy, trying to convince us to turn around. He looked off to the side slightly, as if listening to someone, before chuckling and saying, You're absolutely right, Johnson. He certainly isn't able to fake an English accent. I peered over to where the driver was looking, only to see one of the burned corpses giving a skeletal grin back at me, its lips seared off by the heat. It seemed to be partially melted into the floor, and was very clearly dead. You're absolutely mad! I exclaimed, looking around at the corpses in horror. Don't you realize the rest of the crew is dead? The driver laughed. Dead? No, no, no. You German bastards may have taken out the commander with that lucky shot of yours. But the gunners and I are just fine. And we're going to take the fight all the way to the Kaiser's palace. As I was about to respond, suddenly I heard the rhythmic rat a tat of a machine gun firing. Looking around, I noticed one of the guns was aiming and firing itself, as if being manipulated by some invisible hands. Excellent shot, Fred, exclaimed the driver, gleefully. I noticed for the first time the rather large hole in the tank's armor, nearly six inches across, exactly where the commandeered German tank had struck the vehicle, which saved me from oblivion only an hour or so prior. I remember the flames licking out from the wreck and realized it must have been impossible for any of the crew to have survived it. I looked back to the driver noticing how completely free from harm he seemed. And there wasn't so much as a scratch or even any sweat staining his uniform. He seemed as if he had just arrived at a war, straight out of training. There is something inherently unsettling about realizing that the man you were talking to is already dead. We've all heard ghost stories, tales of unquiet spirits walking amongst the living. But to see one right in front of you, a man completely unaware of his own death, still walking and talking as if he were alive. It's completely different. Why are you doing this? I asked, my voice shaky, following my realization of what exactly the driver was. Why? To win the war, of course. I won't stop until you warmongering bastards have surrendered. Till the war is won. Till we can finally just all go home. The driver was practically screaming, waving his gun around like a conductor's baton. It was then that I realized what I had to do. You don't have to fight anymore. You've beaten us. You've won. The Kaiser just announced it. The war is over. I was sent to tell you that you don't need to fight anymore. The driver's face seemed confused. We, we won? We did it? It's all over? I nodded, hoping this would work. The ghost, or whatever it was, seemed to think I was a German soldier, so maybe it would believe me. Yes, it's all over. The fighting is done. You can rest now. You did your duty, for king and country. And now it's time to rest. You can go home now. The driver lowered his pistol, staring off into space. For king and country, he whispered, eyes glazing over. Yes, for king and country, I said, trying to keep him talking. It's all over. You won. You served well, with honor and courage. Your nation is proud of you. A single tear flowed down the driver's cheek as he began to gently sway back and forth. After a moment, he once again murmured out the words. For king and country. As I watched, the young man's uniform began to darken 
then crumble into ashes. His skin started to blacken as his eyeballs burst, the vitreous fluid dribbling down his face, only to evaporate into steam moments later. His hair started to fall in clumps, crumbling into soot as it hit the floor. In the space of a few seconds, the once lively looking soldier collapsed into a pile of ash and bones. As soon as this was complete, the engine sputtered and fell silent. I staggered out of the tank, dazed from what I had seen. I called out to the others that it was all safe, that they could come out. Eventually, the other lads came out of their hiding spots and asked me what had happened. I didn't answer them. I just pointed to the open door of the tank as I began to march back out of the forest. I never heard an official explanation for what had happened with the tank. I never went looking for one. I imagined the higher-ups just filed away the report of what was found there. The eight burnt bodies of the tank crew, assuming it was some sort of mistake or a sick joke. My time in the war didn't last much longer after that final incident. A few weeks later, a stormtrooper gouged my eye out with a knife. And that was that. I was sent back home with nothing but a medal and a missing eye to show for my time in the war to end all wars. I wish I had some explanation for all that happened to me, that there was some common threat linking these three events. But as hard as I try, I cannot find one. I've tried to convince myself I was just barmy, that shell shock made me imagine these horrible things, but I can't. I know in my heart of hearts that my memories of these events are true. I cannot deny their veracity any longer. I'm going to hide this journal now that I've finished writing these accounts. After I die, someone will find them. And maybe the world will be ready to hear these stories. Maybe someone else will put together the dots and figure out what I couldn't. I only wonder how many others had similar experiences and, like me, chose never to speak of them. That is the end of my great-grandfather's journal. I was unable to verify anything about the final tale, as there are no records of any friendly fire incidents at the battle he described. However, it is true that such incidents are often underreported, and it is often difficult to find accurate records after over a century has passed. Alas, I cannot find any logical connection between my great-grandfather's experiences. I do not see a common link between them, nor any rational explanation for what he describes. My only theory is this. Perhaps, when the world is wrecked with constant violence and pain, reality itself is wounded. Maybe, when the whole world is drowned in blood, strange things awaken from the darkness to lap it up. When the whole world has gone mad, what does a bit more Madness matter.